dinner with John, he said, you know, what did you learn, you know, doing this book? And one thing I learned is people were really fucking complex, right? So when we think of Judge Julius Hoffman, the infamous judge at the Chicago 8 trial, and certainly the epitome of evil, I found mm-hmm. out that a decade before he defended and approved the William Burroughs Naked Lunch as a legitimate piece of literature. Mm-hmm. I found out that Mayor Daley, who we also think of as a scumbag, as he you know, had his Gestapo troops beat kids with batons, I found out that he never wanted to be in Vietnam, and he was petitioning LBJ to have a, a conference at Notre Dame University to try to get the hell out of Vietnam. Mm. Uh, I found out that, I mean, I kind of already knew this, one of the reasons I wrote the book. Uh, contrary to popular belief, Jerry was not a Reaganite or Republican uh, in his later yippie, yuppie years. He was a liberal Democrat with a tie, much like Tom Hayden. I found wow. out that... Uh, are. Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> Tom Hayden was a great American. He didn't work for no stockbrokers. No, I, I didn't say that. Okay. I said that <laughs> Jerry Rubin and Tom Hayden were both liberal Democrats. They both wore a tie in the 80s. Yeah, well, that's true. Okay. <laughs> the other thing I found out is that Jerry did not sell stocks or bonds. Jerry was the marketing director of a Wall Street firm that was looking for investors in solar panels and green energy. Abby and Jerry were always obviously very competitive. And so when they did their yippee yuppie uh, debates, you know, they were both making good money. And so Abby was bragging to his friends, you know, I want to compete with Jerry financially. So Abby was taking his money that he was making on the yippee yuppie debates. And there was a there was a broker on the Chicago Stock Exchange had been a former Weather Underground member. So Abby was buying and selling foreign commodities and actually doing quite well. Uh, and I point this out not to say that Abby's uh, an idiot, I mean, uh, evil for investing his money. But it's, it's again, uh, you know, everything is not always quite what it appears to be. Uh, so Abby did have some years uh, when he first came up out of the underground um, where he was doing quite well financially. Unfortunately, we know Abby died penniless in a chicken coop, but that's a different part of the story. Um, the other interesting fact, you know, Abby is obviously much more revered and, and better known in, in 2018 and has already been the subject of five or six books. That's why I decided that Jerry needed his due. Um, I was given complete access to Ruben's archives and this this thing weighs five pounds, and there's literally all kinds of interesting letters and ephemera. Um, one interesting thing is I was sitting there <clears throat> in the village with Ratso Sloman, and he said to me, he said, you know, Jerry lived right across the street, uh, and when he moved down in 1972, he left behind some of his mail, and a friend of mine lives there, let's go and knock on the door and get some of Jerry's mail that had been sitting there since 1972. And one of the things I found was this letter from Norman Lear, producer of All in the Family, thanking Jerry for Jerry's generous offer of offering to come on to All in the Family for one episode as Jerry Rubin Yippie and, and debate with uh, Archie Bunker and the Meathead. Uh, that never actually occurred, of course, but you know that's the type of ephemera uh, that's in here. There's uh, there's a letter from Eldridge Cleaver when he's in exile in Algiers. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of wacky uh, stuff in here. So Jerry grew up in Cincinnati, and he. Uh, you know, a lot of people say these that many of the uh, you know protesters of the '60s were upper middle class kids. Jerry was totally working class. His dad drove a bakery truck and died of a heart attack uh, when Jerry was about 20. His mom was a housewife, died of cancer also when Jerry was around 20. So uh, Jerry was was not a trust fund kid. Uh, he became a father sort of by default because his younger brother was 12. So, out through, so throughout the 60s, when Jerry's protesting, he's also taking care of a kid, which many people uh, did not realize. Uh, so Jerry gets to UC Berkeley just in time for the tail end of the free speech movement, 
and inspired by Mario Savo and that gang, Jerry and Stu Albert and several others start something called the VDC, the Vietnam Day Committee. And when you see documentaries of the troop trains going through Berkeley on their way to the port of Oakland, sending troops over to Vietnam, it's Jerry and others um, that are laying down on those troop trains. Uh, as I dug deeper into things, I found out that around this time, Jerry goes to Cuba with Bob Dylan's girlfriend, Susie Rotolo. Oh. And they meet Che Guevara, and they meet uh, Castro. I found out that Marsha Hunt, if you're a Rolling Stones fan, you know who she is. Uh, she was marching with Jerry through the streets of Berkeley. So there's all these weird sort of uh, six degrees of separation. Anyway, Jerry's protests in Berkeley get the attention of HUAC, the House on American Activities Committee, that we all remember as, you know, Joseph McCarthy's communist witch hunt. And Jerry comes up, this is 1966, he comes up with this great idea to put on a revolutionary war uniform and hand out copies of the Declaration of Independence uh, when he's subpoenaed by Congress. Brilliant. And John here said a great quote, I think, when he interviewed him. He said, you know, that was the first time I saw somebody on the left with a sense of humor. Well, I was in prison at the time. 66? Yeah, I was in the Detroit House of Correction. It was summertime. Okay. And I had a big story about that. I believe it was in Life magazine or one of the... That's right. So... Showing Jerry Rubin with his revolution. That, yeah, That's right. And, and my point here is that, is, again, just because there's always been a competitiveness, just to mention that Jerry got to the front page of the newspaper first. Uh, this caught the attention of Abby. Abby, of course, had done some civil rights work, had gone down south, but Abby had not really done anything in Manhattan just yet. Uh, he had a free store. He had a free store, right. He was, there was the diggers and there was the uh, provost. Uh, anyway, David Dellinger calls up Jerry and invites him to New York to, to, to put his base of operations there in mid-67. And so within days, Jerry and Abby meet, uh, along with a bunch of other guys, Jim Ferrat, Ratzel Sloman, and they get this idea to drop $1 bills onto the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Now... Normally, it would take an atomic bomb to shut down the New York Stock Exchange, but there was a balcony, and as they're going up there, the security guards started hassling these guys, like, you know, what are you crazy hippies going to do up here? And one of them wisely said, you trying to keep Jews out of the New York Stock Exchange? <laughs> they said, no, 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 all Jews are welcome to the New York Stock Exchange, right? And these guys tossed $1 bills down the New York Stock Exchange, and trading stopped for a few hours where all these guys were scrambling for the money, right? And within days, plexiglass, bulletproof glass went up so that no one could ever repeat this. So Dellinger wanted to do a march on Washington and he wanted to surround the Capitol building. And Rubin said, you know, the Pentagon is the heart of the military industrial complex. Let's go to the Pentagon. And Dellinger thought that was cool. And then Abby said, let's levitate the Pentagon. So as it got closer and closer to the levitation of the Pentagon, this is, we're coming up on October 67, Jerry is called down to Arlington, Virginia in advance by the National Park Service, and he's negotiating with the government of how many feet they can levitate the Pentagon. Uh, now, I don't have to tell anybody here, but remember, you know, these guys didn't have a Facebook page, they didn't have a Twitter account. So the levitation of the Pentagon idea is sort of spreading a little bit of word of mouth, some underground newspapers. Don't, don't leave out Ed Sanders. Yes. At this juncture. Okay, thank you. Yes, Ed is also part of this, and the Fugs uh, are chanting out demons out at the Pentagon. This later goes on to their 1967 Elm, I think, Tenderness mm -hmm. Junction. Anyway, LBJ announces, holds a press conference, and says, I don't want these dirty hippies in Washington. And Ruben announces, well, thank you, LBJ. You've now just given us front page coverage. Uh, the, now, the next big move, of course, is Chicago 68 and the Democratic Convention 
riots and things like that. Uh, I'm not going to dig too deep into what happens there other than we know that there's then a big trial, the Chicago 8 trial, and that's where the multimedia part of my uh, presentation comes along because I'm going to play you at the height of the trial, 1970, Phil Donahue is just starting out as a talk show host, and it's, it's a regional show. He's ma mainly he's based in Cleveland, and so he's got Jerry on, and we're going to listen to some snippets of, of Jerry, Jerry's outrageousness at the height of, uh, of the Chicago trial. Now, this first piece I'm going to play, listen carefully, he accuses, well, he's, 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 he's pranking, but he's, he's, he's accusing Phil of being one of the biggest drug dealers in New York City. Which war? The war at home? The, the war over there? The, the Vietnam, Vietnam War's going the on. The Vietnam War. Well, it's an Asian war now. You know that. The war's going on in Laos, Cambodia, all over. The United States just get out of Asia. That'll solve a whole problem. Yo! Get out of Asia. Solve every single problem. No, you, you, you didn't answer my question. I'm, I didn't I'm, hear your question. I am sincerely asking you if it is possible that this sort of, uh, you know, sort of theater so turns people off that it then it might be easier for Nixon to be reelected, for example, in 72. Is that possible? Oh, well, Nixon, he, see, Nixon, oh, the, Nixon doesn't think black people exist. I didn't Nixon ask you about that. I don't care what you ask. I'm giving the answer that's in my head. Nixon doesn't think black people exist. Nixon doesn't think young people exist. Nixon's only concerned about the middle silent majority, which we don't have to worry about because it's silent. Uh, what is that? I have a silent majority. Well, how do you know? It's silent. Um, Young people are the only people in this whole country that have saved the soul of America by protesting the yeah. crimes committed in Vietnam, Asia, and at home in the courts and in the jails, etc. Already I'm concerned about... See, I, I get the feeling you're giving me... sincerity here. Uh, you're oh. giving me answer 23B, so you want to... No, it's 27A. Right. Well, let's... let's this, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean, don't you? It no, is, I don't. Well, I'm disappointed that you don't seem to be able to converse with me. You know, sort of, I ask you a question, you start waving your eyes and look at those people. Why don't you look at me, I, uh, and I'll ask you a question, because it's sincerely asked. Didn't I just... I, no, I, I no, I want, I I want to you, know. I've met you before. I don't didn't, think didn't so. did we meet 5th Street in New York? You saw me that dope? <laughs> you might, what, are, what are you doing? Sort of uh, on the side, you're a TV personality, and you're the biggest dope dealer in New York City. Yeah. And you come on, he comes on the show real sincere. <laughs> oh, sincerely. Tell people about your real activities, man. Yeah, that's you, cute. You, you got the best LSD and best pot in town. You come, you fly in, you, no wonder you know the air schedule so well. You're flying in New York and making deals on 5th Street, 6th Street, 17th. He comes on here real serious now. You think it might be long? That, that's cute. <laughs> that's true. Uh, okay. you're, you're upset that I've, uh, I've, uh, but I've destroyed your cover. But, you know, if, if you're... I have to, you can understand how I would question the sincerity of your convictions about the war and people dying in Vietnam and people dying here at home and the my problems wife, of poverty. My when wife, you come out and tell funny stories about me my, selling dope, my, that's wasting my, time. My, here. my wife is right now in uh, Sweden uh, meeting with the Viet Cong and the uh, North Vietnamese. Young people, you understand look, what bothers me? No, I don't, because you, you, you've got a psychological problem. I'm not your psychiatrist. <laughs> look, young people, young, young, young people know that this government has no morality, that this country was founded on the destruction of the Indians. Yeah. Young people, you speak for yeah. young people? I, I'm, I'm speaking for, for, for myself, right, and I'm speaking for a truth that I feel in the streets, right. and if you don't feel it, you're blind. Because yeah. young people know the people that have power in this country have no soul, no morality, and no ears. Yeah. Absolutely not. And we know, and we know, we know that this war is not going to be ended by writing a letter to President Dick Nixon. Because Dick, Nick, Dick Nixon is a criminal. He's a war criminal. He is a war criminal. He, 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 he missed his chance in Nazi Germany. He would have done very well as the head of the, of, of the Hitler Republic. And now he's just the head here. And I, Spiro Agnew, what do you think he is? He's just a super Nazi. You know that. And we know that the only way to change this country is by overthrowing the government. That's the only way. That's the only way to warn Vietnam is going to be ended. How else do you think it's going to be ended? By writing a letter to Dick Nixon, please get out of Vietnam. What are you talking about? He's a racist. When, when, when a yellow person dies in Vietnam, that doesn't count, because the only good yellow person is a dead yellow person in Dick Nixon's head. You don't, you don't think it's possible that the polarization that your kind of behavior creates, I'm asking you a question, can serve... I'm listening. Can serve... Back. Right. I don't think... John, what do, you, what do you think of when you hear that? Uh, I don't know. You know I don't you're... think of anything. Yeah. It reminds me why I don't watch television. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's what I, was I pay no attention to anyone that has some idiotic opinions like that guy, Phil Donahue, whoever he is. Is that Dr. Phil? 
No, that's not Dr. Phil. I get, I get, get a mixed up. But I meant, you know, hearing hearing Jerry, I mean, you probably haven't heard Jerry's voice in uh, a long time. And, and the whole yippee, uh, the whole yippee aesthetic. I was curious what, what, what brought to mind there. Well, I don't know. I mean, I was a subscriber. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I was a yippie myself, so. Sure, sure. I endorse him 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Quite frankly. Um, we're going to listen to... Uh... Fuck Phil Donahue. <laughs> <laughs> His dope wasn't any good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for the record, uh, you know, Phil, Phil was also a liberal. And, uh, and Phil actually enjoyed this little thing because for his 20th anniversary show, he replayed and rebroadcast this. Really? And it went out across a national audience. Uh, that's how I wound up grabbing a copy of it. Um, but I, wa I want to hear a little more about, there's two more short pieces here from Jerry. And of course, you know, no surprise, we can take out the word Nixon and we can substitute the word Trump. Uh, and we can also talk about, think about, you know, young people. It's quite an insult to Nixon, though. Well, it is. In fact, uh, uh, you know, Nixon at least had the EPA and a few other Nixon things. Nixon knew the difference between the Republican and the Democrat, you know, for that's, example. That's true. Uh, let's listen. Unlike our present company. Yes. Let's listen to uh, track 13, 13 from the top. America, America only responds to fire. They only recognize poverty when the ghetto's burned. All of a sudden, the ghetto's burned, and people said, hey, maybe people are poor, maybe blacks are oppressed. They only recognize the war in Vietnam when somebody burned himself in the Pentagon, when 100,000 people went up and sieged the Pentagon. You know, take, this, take these liberal senators like McCarthy and McGovern and, and Kennedy, all, the, all, all those guys. They only spoke after the crazies, the freaks, the nuts, the idiots went into the streets and started burning draft cards, Started, started throwing rocks at buildings. Then all of a sudden they said, well, these young people, their methods might be good, but they got a point. What are we doing over in Asia, Asia anyway? You see, so we, we, we know that this country only responds to polarization and dramatic protests. We're talking with Jerry Rubin. A member We're of talking with Dr. Phil Donahue and Smoke Dope. <laughs> the thing is, it's very easy for me to, to be an, an American and be on American land and soil and to advocate a revolution in Hungary or Russia. A lot of people go around this country, the patriots go around this country advocating to overthrow the Russian government, the Chinese government. Nothing happens to them. They're dressed in red, white, and blue. They're the American Legion. The, the test comes when you advocate change in your own country. And look what happens to us when we advocate change in our own country. We cross state lines to go to Chicago to protest the Democratic Convention. The, the, the pigs attacked us in the streets, wouldn't let us assemble in the parks, wouldn't let us march. This was in America in 1968, you see? And, 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 and the organizers of those marches ended up uh, in court, federal trial, five months, with Julius Adolf Hitler Hoffman as the judge. And we ended up getting uh, 25 years all together, five years apiece. Our lawyer was sentenced to five years in jail. So the young, the young people in this country who try to change the government find out they end up in jail. Timothy Leary is right now in jail in California for 20 years. John Sinclair, the Minister of Information of the White Panther Party, is in jail for 10 years for smoking dope. Bobby Seal, Eldridge Cleaver, Huey Newton, the Black Panther Party has systematically attacked. Yeah. Wait a minute, you, wait a minute. You talk too much, dear. Uh, that's okay. Uh, the Black Panther Party has been systematically attacked by, by the by the by the, by the pigs at the federal and state level. So anyone who tries to protest in this country finds out that there's no First Amendment. It doesn't exist. Okay. The Constitution true. doesn't exist. Yes, ma'am, we have to make a break. You wanted to make a point. Yes, I did want to make Briefly. a point, Mr. Rubin. No. As a... Jerry. As a what? Jerry. As a P.A.P.S., I am ashamed of him. I personally am also against the society. I feel that there are a lot of things that should be changed. But let's face it, no man who is established in his position is going to listen to a young and very intelligent man. I'm not running him down on his mind. His mind is very good. But no man who is established in his position as a congressman, as a businessman, or anybody is going to listen to someone who dresses and speaks up and talks as he does. Well, now, but he claims they wouldn't listen to the American No, he can't. I I protest because I'm living with the man, because I do what so I So the, the, the housewife calling in uh, doesn't like Jerry's get-up. You know, Jerry's got a big bushy beard, wearing a tie-dye shirt and a headband. And so she's basically saying, I like Jerry's anti-Vietnam War stance. I can't stand looking at him. Uh, so 
after the Chicago well, 8 trial. Well, smells bad, too. Well, Jerry's FBI files mentions that he had B.O. See? <laughs> How would they know? <laughs> so, after the Chicago trials ends, the next thing that happens is the 72 uh, presidential bid. Jerry and Abby become tight with John and Yoko. Our buddy John here, of course, is the benefit of a, of a, of a big uh, concert and a song by Lennon. And then there's this whole discussion of which John was part of, which is the, the voting age had now gone from 21 to 18. And so Ruben had this idea of doing this cross-country tour with John and Yoko and John and a few others playing free concerts and, and getting people to register and vote. And this was really terrifying Nixon and his boys because they knew that John Lennon could really bring in the youth vote. So in another one of those weird uh, truth is stranger than fiction, there was an internal committee at the White House called CREEP, Committee to Re-elect the President, led by Gordon Liddy. So Liddy goes to Ehrlichman, he says, I want to kidnap Jerry Rubin and hold him, into a, hold him in a Mexican prison until the 72 election is over. And Ehrlichman says, man, that's too fucked up even for me. Uh, of course, Lenin, they start to get him on deportation charges. So Lenin starts to sort of withdraw from this idea. Now, after the 72 election, and we know there's a giant landslide by Nixon, uh, Jerry just sort of feels like the 60s are over. Uh, one of the th interesting things is I probably asked about 50 radicals where they thought was the end of uh, the 60s, and some people said Kent State. Uh, Rennie Davis uh, and Country Joe talked about the May Day, 71, in Washington, D.C. Uh, but I think that Jerry was really, like a lot of people, was suffering from fatigue, and so he moved to San Francisco and kind of went through a whole, what I call Jerry's New Age period, where he's at Esalon and he's doing health food and yoga and things like that. You ought to also mention here that, if I might say so, that uh, they were attacked, him and Abby and Ed Sanders and all the former yuppies were viciously attacked by other left-wing elements for urging people to vote in the 1972 election, led by Tom Fursad, who was later the founder of High Times Magazine. That's, and that's, Dana Beale, and they called themselves the Zippies. That's, that's and They exactly. wanted to take over the Youth International Party and keep it on a left wing. They thought voting was really backwards. That's right. The Zippies actually went crazy when they saw Jerry and Abby and Ed Sanders endorse McGovern. Do you think that the, the Zippy, this Tom Fursad, could, could have been involved in some sort of undercover, like a CIA? Well, or, we always thought Tom Fursad was a CIA agent with no basis something. in reality, just that he was such a creepy guy that you figured I mean, it you would be easy, to, easy to understand guy. that he was a right. government guy. Cause yeah. he was. Well, you but know, on the other hand, he smuggled thousands of pounds of pot. They had right. loads of nine tons coming. For those who don't know, Tom Versada is also the founder of High Times yeah. magazine. What better CIA cover could you have? That's that's true. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't really. <laughs> yeah, I think he was just an asshole. I, I think I'm going to go with John's way in on that one. Uh, and Versada <laughs> right committed way. suicide, I think, by the late '70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he man, also destroyed man. Your, uh, this, Was it the '72? Jazz festival were they or 70, oh, I 73? I thought the Zippy did something. They didn't destroy anything, they were defeated. <laughs> <laughs> they tried to attack the Blues and Jazz Festival. They tried to attack. On the grounds that it was counter revolutionary to charge a twenty dollar ticket for three days of concerts. Headlined by Ray Charles yeah. and Sun Ra. <laughs> wow. They were idiots. So we opposed them. Uh, one of the things I want to add, this, this is not just, <laughs> just me spewing my opinions. I, I interviewed almost 100 other people, uh, and there's a lot of first-person accounts in here of things, uh, including the Zippy thing. The other thing is, is that 
most books about the 60s are written by white guys like me interviewing other white guys, praising other white guys. And there's over two dozen women in here, Judy Gumbo, Nancy Kershaw, uh, many, many women I tracked down, uh, about, about 30 women, and so I'm <coughs> proud to announce that it's not just a bunch of guys uh, circle jerking each other around. Uh, so the ladies get to have... What was the rest of the racial issue? Was... The racial issue? You just said it was all a bunch of white people. Well, I meant if you're doing a book about the yippies, it's generally going to be white guys talking about other white guys. That's that's all I meant, right? Oh, okay. You know, in other words... Uh, you can always ask black people, you know. Well, there is Bobby Seals in this book. I talked to Bobby. Uh, but uh, So Jerry, you know, always had a sense of humor. And in 1975... To when, say the least. He did. He did. In 1975, when Saturday Night Live started... The very second episode ever, the first season, some National Lampoon guys decided to write a television commercial spoof. So we're going to hear, ideally we'd be watching it, but Jerry is, is peddling revolutionary wallpaper on the second episode of Saturday Night Live. The 1960s, a time of change, a time of sharing, a time of growth. Hi, I'm former Yippie leader Jerry Rubin. And I lived those years with you, burning draft cards, liberating the administration building, and of course, scrawling revolutionary slogans on the walls in spray paint. Now the Berkeley Collection has captured those colorful years, and the graffiti that tells it like it was on these pre-trimmed, pre-pasted rolls of durable, decorator-approved wallpaper, perfect for your den or recreation area. Join me in a protest march down memory lane with a pattern we call the dissident. Too heavy for you? I understand. Perhaps the peacemaker is more your bag. But no matter where your head is at, being free turns everyone on, right? That's why we chose this fit any mood freedom motif for our borders and trim. We call it the digger. No hassle. This wallpaper is vinyl acrylic coated to make it scuff and stain resistant. Wipes clean with a damp cloth. Isn't this out of sight? So take it from me, Jerry Rubin, when I say up against the wallpaper. <laughs> the Connection by Chemistry. It's the same guys who did the great Bob Dylan commercial. Exactly. It is the same guys who did the Bob Dylan commercial. Um, one Hi, more. I'm Bob Dylan. Right, that's the greatest. Uh, one more example here of Jerry's humor. This is from the mid '80s, from one of the Yippie Yuppie debates, and this is how Jerry would open uh, the event each night. You may remember me from the 1960s. I led thousands of young people to the streets, and presidents fighting wars quivered at the sound of my name. I was known and not wanted in many states in the USA. I, uh, the government spent millions of dollars to try to put me and many others in jail for quite a long time. I was the cause of thousands of arguments around the family dinner table between parents and their children, parents warning their children not to be like me. Then came the 1970s and things changed and I shaved off my beard and wherever I went, no one recognized me anymore. So today I never leave home without my American Express card. <laughs> it's a joke, okay? I gotta announce my jokes because uh, people think if you have a credit card, you're in favor of apartheid in South Africa. Uh, so in 1970, Jerry and Stu and some other people went over to England and they were on the David Frost show. Uh, and along with Mick Farron from the Deviants and a bunch of other guys, they sort of took over the David Frost show when Jerry... White Panther Party also. And White Panther. Uh, they sort of took over the David Frost show when 
Stuart Jerry took out a joint and started smoking it and trying to convince <coughs> Frost to smoke it. And so John and Yoko saw this, you know, sort of <coughs> guerrilla theater. They were very impressed. Uh, John, of course, was getting more and more politicized. He'd written Power to the People, inspired by the Black Panther slogan, All Power to the People. Uh, Yoko was obviously teaching him a thing or two. So when John and Yoko arrive in Manhattan in 1971, the first people that they meet are Jerry and Abby. And John and Yoko said to them, wow, we always, uh, we always thought of you as, as, as great artists. And, and they retorted, well, we always thought of John and Yoko as great politicians. And this led to this synergy. I talked a little bit about this before. Uh, Jerry was already a fan of Elephant's Memory, and he introduced John to that band. Uh, Jerry told Lennon about our buddy John here being in prison. Uh, and the funny thing was, as you, as you know if you're a Beatles fan, Lennon only played about six or seven gigs as John Lennon after the Beatles broke up. Four of them have Jerry on percussion. Now, Jerry could not play drums to save his life, but arguably, Jerry played more live gigs as a drummer than any legitimate drummer ever did with Lennon, which is just kind of a funny little aside. Um, there's also a story in the book from Lenny Sinclair where there was a discussion of merging the Yippies and the Panthers, correct? White Panthers. Mm -hmm. And Jerry came up here, and when the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, I guess, got a little heavy one night, Jerry went off to his hotel room because... The funny thing about Jerry is, is Jerry might, was one of the few celebrities of the 60s that was not trying to get laid. Uh, Abby was a big womanizer, and Jerry, just that was just not his bag. Uh, and so I guess Lenny said something like an orgy was starting to brew or something like that, and Jerry ran off. Um, here's David Peel, who's now dead. Uh, this is David Peel speaking to me on the phone. I met John Lennon on St. Mark's Place in 1971. And from there, I invited to him to see. When I say John and Yoko, we thought of them as one. So when I say one of their names, it means both of them. John would never separate from Yoko, even for an hour. So he came to Washington Square Park to see me on Sunday, sometime in 71, with Jerry Rubin as their guide in the city of New York. Jerry was being like a clerical department or an assistant for John Yoko in the village. Right. From that point on, Jerry Rubin, myself, John Yoko became part of me and A.J. Weberman's organization. We had the Rock Liberation Front, an activist organization to speak out about particular rights in America, anything from civil disobedience to the war in Vietnam. And for anything that was controversial that we felt the government were controlling like the NSA does today, we didn't have computers, but we sure had big mouths. As Rennie Davis pointed out to me, I interviewed him, he said, you know, a 17-year-old kid didn't want to read a 30-page thesis on how the French got us into the Vietnam War. Boring. Yeah, we didn't want to go for the Guru Maharaji either, like uh, Rennie Davis. Uh, and so Not a good source. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, but what Rennie was saying is, is that in hindsight, the Yippies, he feel, were very important because they did use humor, you know, to sort of right. disarm people. This is Jerry in the <clears throat> 1980s on Good Morning America, kind of talking about the anniversary of the Chicago 8 trial. And Jerry Rubin is with us this morning in the studio, one of the original defendants in the trial. Nice to have you both with us. Thank you. Thank you. 1968 was such a time, Jerry, of political activism. Yeah. This is now a time of political quietude. Why is this movie relevant now, do you think? I think this movie was always relevant because it's about young people standing up for themselves. And it really is the symbolic event of a generation, a generation that's now in their 30s and 40s and trying to deal with the present. I think it's being made today because our generation is now moving into positions of power and is now able to look back at the 60s. This movie should have been made in the 70s. It was relevant in the 70s, it's relevant in the 80s, it's relevant in the 90s. It's great What's theater. That? It's, uh, it's and, a and movie it's HBO exciting. did about Chicago And I think it's going to really make people ask themselves, what am I doing today and how did the 60s relate to what I'm doing today? And how have I changed and what does it mean? I'm going to come back to your point about great theater in a moment. Jerry, let me, let me come back to what you said about great theater. Because yeah. I've always been interested in the motivation that... The, you had the original eight and then seven after bobby seals trial was broken off did you look at it as theater did you look at it as a as a sort of a passion play we saw the courtroom as theater we wanted to make a statement we knew that we were representing a generation that was making a statement at that time 
we wanted to expose the fact that judges have unlimited power and sit in their robes and, and, and make statements about people. Uh, the, the gagging of Bobby Seale, here was a black man gagged in an American courtroom who went across the country. We were very conscious of using the media. Uh, when Abby and I walked in with wearing judges' robes that day, we were saying defendants have moral authority too. You know, we were, in a sense, not defendants. We were offendants. I mean, we took the offensive in the courtroom. And uh, we used the courtroom to make a national statement. And I think it, it, that statement really related to so many people's lives in that period. And I think that's why it's so important it's being shown now. When were you, when you were in the streets of Chicago in 1968 and disrupting the Democratic Convention, did it occur to you guys at the time that you may be doing things that would elect Richard Nixon? Ah, tough question. Of course, we're unhappy that Richard Dixon was elected, but our, our great priority was trying to really galvanize the American people against the war in Vietnam. And I think the 68 demonstrations really moved the people into the streets, and it was a tremendous example of how a people can say no to the Pentagon, the United States should not be in Vietnam. And I think, in a way, what happened is, in the 70s, is the entire nation kind of embraced what we were saying in the courtroom in the, in, in the 60s. It doesn't seem so radical watching it, the, the statements that we're making then, because, in a sense, we, we became establishment because the establishment absorbed us. Jerry Rubin, Robert Lozier, thank you for being with us this morning. The movie is Conspiracy, and it's on HBO. Thanks both for being with us. I love this quote I found from Jerry's best friend, uh, wasn't really obviously Abby because they were often conflicting, but Stu Albert was a very key part of the Yippies. He's, he was kind of the, the number three guy just below those two. And so in 1989, Stu pointed out, he goes, Jerry has now fallen in love with the Chicago 8 prosecutors. The prosecutors portray you as brilliant, courageous, consistent, audacious, and imaginative. You like that image. Obviously, the people defending you play you as a victim, weak, not attractive. Hmm. <laughs> kind of an interesting thought, right? Yeah. <laughs> it is said to be portrayed as a victim of those assholes. Yeah. Because really, we were attacking them full face, relentlessly, never stopped. One interesting thing I hadn't realized is that Fred Hampton is murdered during the height of the Chicago 8 trial. And I don't think it's a coincidence. Of course not. Just before the trial began in September 1969, all the Chicago 8 defendants and their lawyers met with Fred Hampton and Bobby Rush of the Black, Par Black Panthers to discuss violent protesting. The Panthers were against the angry street violence being suggested by the weathermen. Always. The Chicago Panthers wanted a disciplined and orderly right. show of support for their chairman, Bobby Seale. Right. Fred said, who the hell are these white kids anyway? Hadn't they already learned enough about the brutality of the Chicago police force in 68? Fred became a reassuring and calm fixture in the courtroom in support of Seal. In his 1971 collection of Free Thought, We Are Everywhere, Jerry Rubin captured the essence of Fred Hampton. I remember an auto automobile ride from O'Hare Airport to a hotel. I'll never forget it. I had arrived in Chicago by plane from New York around the same time Bobby Seal arrived from San Francisco. Fred Hampton met Bobby at the airport, and on the way in the car, we laughed and told stories and discussed the trial. My attention focused on the driver of the car, Fred Hampton. I was wildly impressed by Fred, says Jerry Rubin, only 20 years old. It was the first time Fred had met Bobby Seal. Fred ran down to Bobby, the state of Illinois party, all the beefs on his head. The next day at a rally, I saw Fred speak and electrified the crowd with energy and passion. I am a revolutionary, he had the crowd cheering. Hampton was the kind of leader whose self-confidence and drive would inspire other young blacks to join the party. When I saw him, I thought of Huey, Eldridge, and Bobby. A cloud of death hung over Hampton. Hampton told me how the pigs were after him. We don't have much time. So, so yeah, this, uh, this book, there's also... Uh, well, let's just finish that by saying they came into his apartment and shot him in the bed while he was asleep after drugging him with uh, sleeping pills. And the uh, FBI operative had infiltrated their household and was the head of security. Yep. That's how that happened. 
One of the things about Jerry is even if even after he had a suit and a tie on for many years, nobody ever really wanted to give him a job because they always thought there must be a little yippy deep inside there. So no one was going to, let's say, give him the keys to this bookstore to find out that over the weekend he decided to give all the books away. So Jerry always had to kind of come up with his own scheme to make money. Now, I mentioned that his parents had both died in their 50s of, of bad health. And so by the time Jerry was 50, he was absolutely paranoid that he wasn't going to live much longer. And so he became obsessed with longevity and vitamins, and that's what he started doing. And so, but Jerry never stopped smoking weed. I want to just add that in there. He always loved to get high. And so on one day, he was sitting there and had gotten the munchies and decided to cross six lanes of traffic in L.A. around 5 p.m. trying to go get some food. Mm. And he was hit by a car, his body thrown up in the air. He was hit by a second car. Mm. He was in a coma. So Jerry was, you know, obviously brought to the hospital. He's in this coma. And at first, it's a little bit of a media circus. A lot of media people are there. Old hippies that he never met are showing up, you know, just trying to give their love and support in L.A. <clears throat> and so finally, the family decides that only family members can come in and say hello to Jerry. And so one evening, one of his family is sitting there talking to Jerry. Keep in mind, Jerry's in a coma, but, you know, and this black guy comes in wearing a dashiki. And he says, hi, I'm Eldridge. And the family member goes, Eldridge, it's nice to meet you, but it's family only. How did you get in here? He said, oh, I told the nurse's station that I was Jerry's brother. Uh, the next week when Jerry died, the front page of the L.A. Times, it's in here, there's a nice color photo of Eldridge shoveling dirt hmm. onto Jerry's grave. Now, Tim Leary was in L.A., and he came to visit Jerry on Jerry's deathbed. And I happen to have a cassette of Jerry, I'm sorry, I have a, I have a cassette of, of Tim Leary talking to Reuben on his deathbed. So this is Tim Leary in the final days of Reuben. We've all been here in the wedding room. You have so many friends, Jerry. And I've been in for about an hour talking to you and whispering to you. And I'm talking about the old days and the good days to come. And you're surrounded by the love. It's incredible. I've talked to so many people since you've been in the hospital. And, uh, there's just this cloud, cloud, oceans, waves of bubbly love. Uh, you've got a lot of loving friends who are cheering you and whistling with you and waiting for you to open your eyes and smile again. And uh, Mimi, Mimi is absolutely, what a wonderful spirit. What a wonderful, loving, loving mate you have there. She's been with us, keeping us together, loving you. and. We're waiting for you. I can't wait to uh, accept that. Uh, remember, we had a date for dinner. So you owe me that dinner, and I'm waiting for you to come to dinner because uh, we planned it and uh, it's going to happen. All my love. All my love. Timothy, I'll be back. Timothy, I'll be back. Love you. So um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask some questions So um, for you. So what would you ask him? You would ask him how he feels. How do you feel? Well, Jerry, uh, frankly, I've been in a state of shock for yeah. three days. You're on our minds, you're on our hearts, so that I can't say that this is feeling uh, good. Uh, my life is going well. Uh, it's our time, Jerry. You know, the tide that started way back in the 60s is you know, building up. So I'm enjoying it, and uh, the spirit is growing for everything we did together, Jerry. So. Uh, in general, openly, I feel good, but I mean, like all of your dear friends in a state of shock, we miss you. You've got to come back to us, Jerry. We love you. That was, that was Tim, and that's how he feels. So that's intense and weird that, uh, you know, I mean, just amazing that it exists, right? The Yippies, uh, tell me about the Yippies. The Yippies were founded uh, on New Year's <laughs> Eve um, on uh, 1967. And uh, we just all got stoned and, and thinking that, you know, that something was happening. First of all, first of all, the way our heads were going, it's, it's a youth revolution. 
And when I say youth, I don't necessarily mean age. People get that confused. Because, you know, like the leader of the yippies and the leader of the revolution, as far as I'm concerned, is Bertrand Russell. Man, he's 90 and he's still doing all kinds of crazy things, you know? He's, he's the yippiest yippie around. And then it's like a whole international thing. I mean, it knows no boundaries. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's an international movement that is like a spiritual movement that people just know what's happening. And the last thing is a party, because it, it's a party. It's got to be fun. I don't believe in building a movement that is not based on fun. But then it's a party in another sense, too, because it's an alternative way of running the world. And then it all fit together into yip, yippee. Yeah, yippee. And um, so the slogan we came up with um, was rise up and abandon the creeping meatball. <laughs> now, I, I, you know, like, I, like this creeping meatball can be anything. Anything you want it to be. Each, one, each person can write down what his own meatball is. It, it could be school. That's definitely a meatball. Whatever was a meatball, it's school, man. We don't want to grow up, because we know what growing up in America means. Growing up in America means that you have to stand up when some fool with robes comes on and stands up. Everyone, please, please rise. Growing up in America means that you got to uh, support the war in Vietnam, and you got to be a responsible citizen. See, we, we don't want to be responsible. We're irrational. We're irrational and crazy. And that's what this whole trial is about. That's what it's, America, America destroys our dreams, and we're fighting to recover our dreams. And here comes a generation of crazies that say we're going to dream forever. We'll call ourselves crazies. We don't want to be responsible. But we don't want to be rational. <laughs> the Pentagon is rational. The government's case is rational. And, and the government must, must have spent a billion dollars to put us in jail. That's damn good. A billion dollars. One missile. You know? I think everyone's goal out there should be to get indicted by the federal government and force them to spend a billion dollars to put you in jail. That should be... If everyone here did that and forced the government to spend a billion dollars, you know, the government eventually would have to turn over to us. They'd have to declare themselves bankrupt. I mean, I, I, I was happy I was indicted. I wanted to be indicted. Thank you. So, remember, guys... The look on a kid's face on Christmas morning when they open up their stocking and there's a, a Jerry Rubin book. Uh, your mother-in-law or your girlfriend, you know, for, for a birthday. So I've come a long way and I hope you guys uh, will buy a book. They're a little pricey, but if you go per pound, right, this is five pounds. You can work out with this thing, right, you can carry it around. Uh, and also, they're actually offering a little bit of a discount. So please buy a book, and I want to thank everybody for coming. Thanks.